Hi Donovan, my wife and I love watching your videos. It was her idea to send you our story, but she asked me to write it. Before this happened to us, I never really thought much about the supernatural stuff, but I do now. 2013 was a big year for us. Abby and I were getting married in October. And then three months before our wedding, we found out we were expecting our first child. With so much going on already, we decided why not add more stress and buy our first house. We had been renting a two-bedroom apartment close to DC for two years, but we were paying so much in rent that we decided it made more sense to move out of the city into a suburb in Virginia. I knew I was looking at a long commute with DC traffic, but it was worth it to actually buy our own house. We needed more space and could get a house for less money than we were paying monthly in rent for our small apartment. Abby was working as a nurse in the ER department not far from our apartment. As soon as we found out about the baby, we realized she wouldn't be able to keep doing the 12 hour shifts. She planned to keep working during her pregnancy, but since we were moving anyway and she was so exhausted with the pregnancy, we decided she needed to quit her full time job. That meant we had to budget for a new house with only my income. With the home prices in Northern Virginia, we definitely couldn't afford our dream home. We looked at a lot of houses and quickly realized that we're not gonna find any new or newly updated house in the location we wanted in our price range. We decided that if the location and lot were good, we would consider a fixer upper. We were just about ready to give up on our house search when we finally found the perfect house. It wasn't exactly perfect as it was, but it was in a great location, on a perfect little lot and well within our budget. The listing described it as a house with a lot of potential. I immediately saw the potential, but Abby needed some convincing. The house had so much character. It was over 100 years old, so much older than any house I've ever thought I would buy. We both loved all the unique little touches we didn't see in most of the cookie cutter homes we had toured. This house had only three bedrooms, but the rooms were huge. It had a big unfinished basement, which wasn't high on Abby's priorities, but I thought it would be great for a workout room and maybe a workshop. Abby had a hard time looking past the odd paint colors and outdated kitchen, but there were some great updates like the roof and the heating and the air conditioning system. At first, I was concerned that a house this age wouldn't be cool enough because it obviously wasn't built with central air conditioning. That would have been a deal breaker for me, but the previous owners who lived there for only two years had installed a top of the line VRF system, which kept the entire house really cool. Abby did love the neighborhood, and after going over the numbers, we decided we could update the kitchen right away. This was enough to get Abby on board with this house. So we offered a full listing price because there was another offer already on the table. We got the call from our agent the next day that the offer had been accepted. I was glad because by that point, Abby had planned out our lives in that little house. Little did she know what would happen in that house. We closed on the house just three weeks before our wedding and moved in right away. We didn't have nearly enough furniture to fill up our new house. We actually didn't have much furniture at all. And what we did have was mostly furniture that our parents no longer wanted. We ordered a new bedroom set, which was delayed, so we ended up sleeping on an air mattress when we moved in. Abby was exhausted after the move, so she went to bed early the first night in the house, probably around 8 o'clock. My brother Mitch had come up from North Carolina, and we were trying to reassemble a shelving unit that had been disassembled for the move. It was a harder job than we expected, and I'm sure the beer didn't help to make it any easier. Mitch was planning to stay at our parents' house that night, but after having some drinks, he decided just to stay on our couch that night. I think it was around midnight when I went to bed. Abby was sound asleep, and I tried to get into bed without disturbing her, as I knew she was exhausted. The air mattress was more comfortable than I expected, or maybe I was just really tired, but either way, I fell asleep right away. I wasn't asleep long when I woke up shivering. I knew the AC worked well in this house, but I was actually freezing. I looked over at Abby and she was still asleep. I got up to see if I could find a blanket somewhere in one of the boxes in our bedroom. As I got out of bed, I could have sworn I saw movement like someone ran out of our bedroom. 
Of course, this made no sense because Abby was sleeping, and we didn't have pets or anything, so I assumed I was imagining things half asleep. I was using the light on my phone to dig through a box to find some blankets when I realized it wasn't even cold in the room anymore, so I went back to bed. We didn't have any blinds on our windows, so the next morning Abby and I both woke up as soon as the sun started shining in our windows. I asked her if she slept okay on the air mattress, and she said she did once I finally stopped coming in and out of the bedroom. I was confused and asked what she meant. She said she heard me opening and closing the bedroom door and pacing in the hallway. She asked what I was doing. I had no idea what she was talking about, and assumed she must have been dreaming. She seemed convinced of it, so I just said sorry if I woke you up, and we left it at that. Looking back, I guess that should have seemed more alarming. I knew I wasn't pacing the hallway. Mitch had already left when I went downstairs. I talked to him later that day, and he asked me if Abby had trouble sleeping. I said no, why? He said he kept hearing walking or pacing upstairs in the hallway. He said he knew it wasn't me because I sound like an elephant when I walk and this was quiet. I told him he was crazy and he must have drank more than I thought he did. But I did think it was strange that Abby had heard the same thing. The next two weeks were really busy. We were still unpacking and getting the new house in order, while getting ready for our wedding. I was also getting used to my new commute. I knew my commute would be longer, but I still wasn't prepared for just how much time I would be spending on the road. Luckily, I was able to flex my schedule so that I could start going in an hour early, which meant I could beat some of the traffic in and out of the city. We had the perfect wedding day and enjoyed every minute of our honeymoon in Punta Cana. After all of the work the past weeks, a week of relaxing on the beach and by the pool was perfect. As much as we enjoyed the time away, we were glad to be back home after our honeymoon. Abby was starting to feel more energetic and was excited about starting the kitchen remodel, which we did as soon as we got home. Abby and I did most of the demolition ourselves in one weekend. My friend, who is a contractor, started working on the kitchen the next week. We had been eating out or getting takeout or microwaving food while sitting on the couch since our kitchen was destroyed. One evening, Abby insisted that we actually have a real dinner at home. We couldn't actually cook in the kitchen, so I grilled some chicken and veggies. Abby set the dining room for a candlelight dinner. We had originally said that we didn't need a house with a formal dining room because we didn't think we would ever use it. But this dining room was really something, especially in candlelight. We had just started eating when Abby started coughing uncontrollably. I asked her if she was okay, and she said that she felt like she couldn't breathe. Obviously, she was breathing because she was able to talk, but every time she tried to eat, she started coughing. She was worried and started to panic because of the baby, so she called her doctor to see if she should go to the hospital. She was on hold with the doctor, and as soon as she walked out of the dining room, she stopped coughing. She apologized for calling, and she said she was now feeling fine. We settled into our life in our new house. Neither of us were sleeping very well. Abby blamed it on the pregnancy. I tried to convince myself it was nothing, but it did sound like there were footsteps in the hallway at night. Not loud, but quiet footsteps. Almost like a child was walking or running in the hallway. We finished the kitchen remodel before Christmas and enjoyed the holidays in our new home. Our daughter Lily was born in March. Looking back, the early years of Lily's life are kind of a blur. Work was getting increasingly stressful. Abby loved being home with Lily, but I know she missed working because she truly loved being a nurse. She said sometimes it felt like someone else was in the house. She couldn't really explain what she meant. I thought maybe she was spending too much time at home alone with Lily and really missed the adult interaction, especially since I was spending longer days at work. When Lily was three years old, Abby found out that a primary care doctor she knew from the neighborhood was looking to hire a part-time nurse, basically to job share with another nurse. This was perfect as Abby was not ready to go back to work full-time, especially with the cost of daycare. Abby got the job working two or sometimes three days per week. We found a great preschool for Lily, and she was so excited to start going to school. She wore her little pink backpack around the house for weeks before preschool even started. Lily loved preschool, and her teacher said she was doing great. 
Lily loved the other kids, but since we dropped her off early before most of the others, we didn't have the chance to meet many of the other children in her class. Lily talked about her friend Anna all of the time. We heard about Anna's pretty dresses and her long braids. Lily wanted to have red hair like Anna and suddenly wanted to wear dresses every day like Anna did. One day, I think it was a Saturday, I walked past Lily's bedroom and she was talking and laughing and singing. She couldn't stop laughing. I asked her what was so funny and she said, Anna is funny. I thought she was laughing about something Anna did at school. I asked Lily if her teacher thought Anna was funny. Lily looked confused and said, Daddy, that's silly. Anna doesn't go to school. I was confused, so I asked, where did she play with Anna? She said, here, Daddy. She lives here, and started laughing and talking to herself again. I told Abby about the conversation. She said she would ask Lily's teacher about Anna, and when she did, we learned that there was no Anna in her class. Lily's teacher told Abby that it's not all that unusual for children that age to have imaginary friends. Lily had such a vivid imagination, and we decided that it was nothing to worry about. That year, we decided to host a Friendsgiving party with some of our neighborhood friends the weekend before Thanksgiving. We invited three families, two of which had little girls about the same age as Lily. Abby set up the kids' table next to the adult table, and Lily insisted that Anna needed a chair at the table. I thought this was going a little overboard, but but Abby had a hard time saying no to Lily. As soon as we started eating, Lily started screaming. This was not like her at all. She frantically said, Mommy, help Anna. Abby immediately ran over to Lily, but Lily was pretty much hysterical. She said, Anna, coughing, help her, Mommy. Abby remained calm and tried to comfort her. Lily ran from the dining room to her bedroom and Abby followed. The rest of us tried to finish dinner, but everyone was definitely on edge. They all knew about Lily's imaginary friend, Anna, but none of us had ever seen Lily act like that. The party was cut short and everyone left before we even had dessert. I went to check on Lily and Abby and found them both asleep on her little bed. They looked so sweet and my heart was still breaking for Lily as I had never seen her so upset. As I was leaving her bedroom, I thought I heard Lily say, Bye bye, Anna. After that dinner, Lily didn't talk about Anna anymore. Abby and I didn't want to upset her, so we didn't ask about Anna, and we all stayed out of the dining room. Abby continued to do great at preschool. In January, it was her turn to be student of the month. This meant that she got to create a poster all about her to share with the class. Lily loves to have her picture taken, so Abby has many pictures on her phone. She was scrolling through pictures for the preschool poster, when I heard her say, what in the world? Lily was sitting on the floor watching TV. Abby walked over to her and showed her the phone. She said, Lily, honey, did you take this picture? Lily loved to take her phones and snap pictures of random things around the house. So I really didn't think much about it until I heard Lily's answer. Yes, that's Anna. We play hide and seek. Abby tried to hide her surprise, but she looked like she could barely stand up. She came over to me and dropped her phone in my lap. Here's the picture that she showed me. We still live in the same house. Lily is eight years old now and she loves being a big sister to our new little baby. Lily hasn't talked about Anna since that dinner when she was three years old. I don't know if she remembers it, but Abby and I will never forget that dinner. I guess we'll never know exactly what happened that night or what happened in this house before it was our house. Hey Donovan, I love your show and I listen whenever I have the time. I love listening to the stories of strange encounters. I never thought I would have the same experience, but last weekend I did. My name's Tom and I work for the New Jersey State Police. Last weekend I was on duty near the Pine Barrens, out around Egg Harbor City in Weymouth. I like working out there because it's easy and the work I do is pretty tame. Maybe catch a guy speeding or get a few DUIs. It's a lot easier than arresting pimps and hookers in Atlantic City or Camden. Anyhow, it was around 10.30 at night and I was staked out on a roadside with the radar gun on, trying to catch anyone speeding. I was getting pretty damn bored to be honest. Just wanted to get home when my shift was done and get some sleep. 
Just then I heard the strangest sound I've ever heard. It was this weird cross between like a hooting sound and a screeching. Sounded like the biggest owl you've ever heard in your life. Then something flashed in front of my windshield. I could see these giant wings. They had to be at least 10 feet across. And then I saw the head of this thing. It was really freaking weird. I'd describe it as goat-like with a long muzzle and these evil red eyes. And the head had these giant horns on top. They had to be at least 12 inches long. The skull looked bony too, like a skeleton head. The thing landed on the roof of the squad car. I could feel its weight deading the top. I grabbed my gun and locked the doors. I wanted to get out and blast it, but I felt frozen inside. I've seen a lot of things in my life. Serial killers, suicide victims, meth heads with no teeth left in their heads. But I've never seen anything like this. I just wanted it to be over. Then I heard glass break and I noticed my back windshield is broken out. Glass is everywhere. There was a strong odor like rotten eggs. Sulfur is what I think they call that smell. Then it was gone. I heard the swoop of the wings and saw it fly off into the headlights. And its long tail was the last thing I saw. So I'm sitting there trying to catch my breath. I called the lieutenant and tried to explain what happened. I call and say, listen, you're not going to believe this, but I'm out in the Pine Barrens and I think I just saw, and that's when he cuts me off. The lieutenant says, you didn't see anything, okay? I said, sir, but I'm telling you I saw something weird. I think it was a Jersey Devil. Again, he cuts me off. You didn't see anything, understand? And if you keep this up, you're no longer a police officer. You will be fired. Now look, I've got a family. I got a five-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. I need this job to survive. I had to just say, okay, sir. I know a lot of you out there probably think I'm a wuss for doing that, but hey, it is what it is. I don't know why I was treated like this, whether it's a cover-up of some kind or what. All I can do is tell my story and I promise every word is true. Oh, and one other thing. The next day, I was reassigned to only working North Jersey now. I think they want to keep me out of the way. Hey there, Donovan. Love your show and you're making the world a better place by sharing the wisdom, brother. I'm a believer. To those who don't believe in Bigfoot, please explain to me what tried to kill me last summer. Okay, my mother lives in Ohio and she just turned 70. I figured I'd be a good son and fly down to visit her as a birthday present. I should mention it was a dream of my mom's to live deep in the woods on a ton of land. Her dream came true. She lives in the middle of nowhere surrounded by deep woods with no neighbors. At night after she went to bed, I would sneak out to smoke a cigarette. She would kill me if she knew I smoked. Anyways, one night I went into the woods to burn one and get some fresh air. Everything was going great when out of nowhere I got a whiff of the most rancid smell I've ever smelt in my entire life. It was like a wet dog, burnt hair, and weak old garbage on steroids. My eyes were immediately teared up. I was wondering if my mom was throwing trash out into the woods and turned on the flashlight on my phone. Looking for the trash, the smell kept getting worse and worse. I had to tuck my nose into my shirt and even that was barely helping. I was about to give up when I heard this huge thud on the ground next to me. I flashed my light on it expecting to find a large animal, but it turned out to be a huge rock. Confused, I started looking around me wondering where this thing could have come from. Before I could complete the thought, I heard another boulder whiz by my head. I was seriously freaked out. So I charged in the direction the rock came from and yelled some profanities as intimidatingly as I could. The putrid smell overwhelmed me and before I could turn back, I came face to face with this terrifying ape-like beast. It was like time froze. I saw its beady eyes, furry head, hairy body, and a face like a demonic caveman. I heard a huge growl that was deep, bellowing, and unlike anything I've ever heard before. I sprinted away as fast as I could towards the house. The sounds that came out of this thing were awful. I will never forget the sound of its growl. 
As I ran, I could hear it coming after me from behind. The sounds of its grunts as it ran still haunt me to this day. I busted through the front door, slammed it behind me, and locked it. The second I turned the lock, the beast banged against the door. I had made it inside safely by seconds. It continued to pound on the door, shaking the entire frame of the house. I had no idea what to do. I stepped back from the door in fear as it kept pounding on the door. My mom came running out of her bedroom screaming, what the hell is that? I couldn't speak, I was in fear for my life. We started grabbing tables and chairs and heavy furniture and began barricading the front door. The sounds finally stopped and I felt a rush of relief flood my body. My mom asked me again, what the hell is that? I didn't have the heart to tell her the truth, so I replied, you have to be careful with bears around here, mom. As soon as I finished my sentence, a huge slam came from the side of the house. I grabbed a kitchen knife and headed over to the sound and prayed I wouldn't have to use the knife. The creature kept pounding on the house. If he kept this up long enough, the wall would actually cave in. Where's dad's shotgun? I asked mom in a panic. She froze. My dad was an avid hunter before he died, but my mom had never held a gun in her life. I grabbed her by the shoulders as the pounding on the walls continued. Mom, this is life or death. Where's dad's shotgun? I don't know. I don't know, she said. Maybe under the bed. I don't know. It was my last hope. I ran into her bedroom and began pulling everything out from under her bed. I threw a box, sewing machine, old yearbooks, and my lacrosse trophies, and all sorts of other junk out of the way. Finally, I felt the cold of the shotgun barrel. I didn't even check if it was loaded. I ran straight back into the living room where this creature was in full swing. Suddenly, silence filled the air. You could hear a pin drop in the house. I heard the wind howling outside and the trees rustling, but no more bashing. I slowly crept out the back door, shotgun at the ready, and crept over to the side of the house. I tried to be as quiet as possible, taking light steps and holding my breath. I could feel my heart pounding as I turned the corner. It was dark outside and I could barely see anything. I went over to where the creature was attacking and the house was ripped to shreds. Debris littered the yard and chunks of wood were ripped off of the house. Large portions were bashed in, and you could begin seeing a faint light from inside the house. Had this continued, it would have broken through the wall in a matter of minutes. The next thing I knew, I hear this terrifying, aggressive roar from behind me. I whipped around and saw the beast sprinting towards me, his huge lumbering arms propelling his giant body towards me at an impressive speed. I closed my eyes, bracing for the impact as I fired off a shot. I heard the dirt as the creature stopped himself with force. Now silence. I fired another shot and heard this strange whooping from the large ape. He took off into the forest so fast I could barely see. I listened to his giant footsteps until they disappeared into the night. I went back inside, mom quivering in fear. Is it dead? she asked. You gotta be careful leaving food out around the bears, mom, I replied and went into the guest bedroom. I closed the door and fell to the floor and contemplated how close we came to death. Was it Bigfoot? If you're asking me, what else could it possibly be? Hi, Donovan. I've been a fan of your show for quite a while now. I was never a believer of the paranormal, until I had this bizarre encounter that changed my life forever. I live in West Virginia, and I was always a hard skeptic due to my strict Catholic upbringing. That changed one night when me and my family were out camping in the woods. It was around 10 p.m. and pitch black outside. We were all sitting around the campfire, enjoying some steaks that my dad had just cooked. Suddenly, my cousin Jimmy said, Did you hear that? We all paused and listened intensely but we couldn't hear anything. Jimmy insisted that he heard something, so my dad suggested that we go look for whatever it was. We all grabbed their flashlights and walked into the woods. The further we walked, the more uneasy I felt. I had a strong feeling that something was watching us, but I refused to believe that it was anything other than my imagination and Jimmy's paranoia. 
The woods were eerily quiet. You could hear all three of our feet crunching on the leaves beneath us. No insect sounds, no animal noises, just a profound silence. We had been walking for about 10 minutes when suddenly we heard a loud screeching noise coming from above us. The sound of the screech was absolutely bone chilling. It sounded like a mixture of nails on a chalkboard and the roar of a lion. It sent shivers down my spine and made my hair stand up all over my body. We all looked up and saw a large creature flying directly over us. This beast was huge. I'm talking easily five or six feet tall. It had these big reflective red eyes that almost looked like they were on fire. Its wingspan was unbelievably massive. The only thing I can compare it to are the wings of a giant bat, leathery and veiny, making a thunderous clap as they flapped. It had thick black feathers covering its entire body. I was absolutely petrified and could not believe what I was seeing. My family members were just as scared as I was, and we all ran away screaming in horror. The woods were thick and dark except for a small circle of light my flashlight emitted. Every rustle of leaves or snap of a branch made me jump and sent my heart racing faster. I could hear Dad's breathing and Jimmy's footsteps ahead of me, but I felt completely alone in the darkness. I was crying and praying and desperately running to survive. I tripped over a branch and collapsed to the ground, twisting my ankle in the process. I heard Dad and Jimmy's screams ahead of me. Help! Run! Faster! Go! I broke my flashlight, and to feel my way towards my family's screams, I tried yelling for help, but they were too far ahead of me and screaming too loud to hear me. Finally, my dad started calling for me and I started to yell loudly enough for him to come look for me. As I saw his flashlight peeking through the trees, I heard the flaps of the beast's wings behind me. I knew it was time to move. I ran towards dad's flashlight, clenching my jaw as hard as I could to overcome the pain of my twisted ankle. I finally reached my dad, and he started screaming, go, go, go. Suddenly I heard this loud screeching noise, and something large crashed through the trees towards us. Dad grabbed my hand, and we ran even faster, but I could feel the thing gaining on us. My pain from my ankle was intense, but my desire to escape from the creature was far more powerful. The trees were thinning ahead, and I could see the campsite just beyond. We were almost there when Dad suddenly pulled me back, and we hid behind a tree as the creature flew overhead. It had huge wings that spanned at least 10 feet, and it was screeching so loudly that I thought my ears would bleed. We were all shaking and crying from terror and relief when we finally got back to the campsite. That night is burned into my memory, and I'll never forget how scared I was. We immediately packed up and drove home. There was no way we were staying in those woods any longer. My family and I spent the entire night trying to discount what we saw, but all of us saw the same thing. We were terrified, and I still don't know what to make of it. Was it an alien? A demon? It was later that we heard descriptions of the Mothman the red eyes, the bat wings and body, and the anthropomorphic limbs. Could it have been a mothman that we so desperately ran away from? I was no longer a skeptic, but a believer in the paranormal. I'd experienced the mothman firsthand, and there was no denying that he existed. I researched the mothman legend online, and I discovered many people had seen him in West Virginia. He seemed to be drawn to that area for some unknown reason. I later learned that the Mothman is often associated with death and disaster. In 1966, there was a bridge collapse in West Virginia that killed 46 people. Some people believe that a Mothman was responsible for the bridge collapse and that he was a warning of impending doom. I don't know if that is true or not, but I do know that it's a creature to be feared. Since my encounter, I've had some nightmares about it flying over me. Its glowing eyes burned into my brain. It's become a permanent part of my life, and I'm always on the lookout for it when I'm camping or driving through West Virginia. I never want to see that again. But part of me is also drawn to it. 
It's a mystery that I'll never be able to solve, but it's left a mark on me forever. I'm writing you from the Navajo Nation in New Mexico, near the border of Arizona. I felt the need to tell my story and the amazing thing I saw last night. As a Navajo, we've always loved the world and what it can offer. We see beauty in the simplest things. We honor the animals we hunt. When the rains come, we savor the water as it allows the plants to grow again. And we've always looked into the night sky with wonder. Last night, that sky brought something to the earth that I will never forget as long as I live. We were outside performing a healing ceremony for one of our tribal elders who has lung cancer. We were singing and dancing and it was getting late. Just then the sky became very bright, like the sun in midday. We saw a round circular ship that seemed to fall right to earth, but land gracefully in a way that defied gravity. We heard a loud buzzing sound coming from the ship. The doors opened and out walked what can only be described as an alien, or one of the greys as I've heard people call it. It was short, off-white in color, and had large black eyes, like that of a fly. We all stood frozen in the night. One of the young men from the tribe tried to run forward with his bow to protect the tribe, but the alien just looked at him, and he was frozen and dropped the bow from his hand. In my mind, I remembered the stories of what happened in Roswell, how a ship from the sky had crashed but the remains were removed and never seen again. I knew that we were now seeing one of them alive. As thoughts raced in my mind, I could sense that the gray could hear what I was thinking. It began putting its own thoughts into my head, communicating without talking. It was telling me stories of how they built the pyramids of Egypt, but man had taken credit for it. The alien walked slowly back and forth looking at us. We smelled a strong earthy smell with a hint of sulfur. It was like whatever planet it was from had different smells than earth. I then told the alien using my thoughts that we were Navajo. We don't live by the ways of modern man. We do not abuse earth. I said your problems are not with us. I told him we have been invaded before but this is now our land, our reservation and we want you to leave in peace. The gray spoke to me telepathically again, saying it understood. It said it would attack the big cities, where man makes nuclear weapons. It said soon the world would see destruction like it's never seen before. Just then, it turned around and walked onto the ship again. It walked like a small child would, using its short legs and small steps. The door closed and the ship blasted far above the stars in an instant. The alien was gone. I pray that it never returns and what it said will not come true. Hi Donovan. Love the show. Especially the episode where you read about the security guard in Northern Virginia. I loved it because I also live in Northern Virginia and I totally believe it. There are so many buildings and things going on here where you would least expect it. I grew up here and I live in the suburbs of Northern Virginia. I'm just inside the westbound line of Fairfax County. For those who don't know, Northern Virginia is filled with suburbs. For as long as I can remember, new neighborhoods were going up all of the time. Especially in the Ashburn area. It's relatively new since I was a kid, but now it's completely overcrowded. There's so many government jobs and tech jobs in this area. Chances are that your neighbors will either work for the government, for a contractor who works for the government, or they're in real estate. There is a mixture of neighborhoods and buildings where I live. Right across the street from where I live is a group of buildings with a large barbed wire fence. There is a field that separates the building from my street, but I can clearly see it. My window to my room is on the back side of my house, which is facing this building. On the outside, it's unmarked. There are no signs or anything with the company name. And they have 24-7 security guards that sit at the entrance gate. This isn't out of the ordinary. There's quite a few places like this around. Who really knows what goes on there? That's why I'm sending you my experience because like I said, I've lived here all my life and I've seen things happen at this building which I'm going to share with you. 
I'm in college now. I just started my senior year at George Mason University. I commute to school to save on room and board, and I transferred there my junior year from community college. In Virginia, you will be accepted into any school if you have an associate's degree from a community college, even the tough schools to get into like UVA. So I started becoming interested in this building about five years ago. I watched it being built when I was a kid, but never really paid any attention to it. It just looked like a regular building to me. But as I got older, something about it sparked my interest. I wanted to know what was going on in there. Why was there security there 24-7? Why were there no signs on the doors or the building? I would often see cars pull up late at night, sometimes around 2 or 3 a.m. Now what is going on there that late at night? The cars would have tinted windows so I could never see who was driving. They would never stay longer than 20 minutes at a time from what I observed. I thought that they were probably dropping something off or picking something up. The weird thing about it is that these drop-offs or pickups always happened at night and not during the day. Well, one night I was staying up late studying and I see lights go off inside the building, like flashing lights you would see during a fire alarm. I opened up my window to my room, but I couldn't hear anything. It was far enough away that I couldn't hear much, but I had some Celestron binoculars that I got for my birthday a few years back. I looked over there through my binoculars, and I see that the lights stop blinking. Then about 10 minutes later, this delivery truck shows up. It was a large white cargo van that pulled up to the side of the building. There were two men who got out of the delivery truck, who entered the building. About five minutes later, they opened the doors to the back of the van, and they are putting what looked like body bags into the back of the van. There were four body bags that they were carrying out to the vehicle that I saw. Now I'm really curious as to what happened over there because this looks very suspicious. Why would an alarm go off and then shortly after they're carrying body bags out of that building? It doesn't add up. Was there a breach of some sort and people died as a result from something they were containing? Was it an experiment that went wrong and exploded? Was this a black site that they used to interrogate people? I don't know, honestly, it could be anything. Over the next few days, there was a lot of activity at that building at night. Many cars and vans were coming throughout the night. This continued for three days and then it slowed down to normal activity. There wasn't anything about it in the local news either. So I started doing some research online and I found out that the building is owned by some company that doesn't have a website or any information about it online. It was a total dead end. I still watch this building at night if I'm up, but there hasn't been any activity like that night where I saw them carry out those bags. I was telling my friends about this and we all speculate what is happening in that building. We think it's some type of testing facility or interrogation center because no one ever goes there during the day. Thanks Donovan for sharing my story. Hi Donovan, my name is Tim and I've been camping all of my life in Western PA. I saw in one of your comments that you're from Pittsburgh. I'm from Washington PA, so pretty close. There are a few parks in Western PA where I go camping all the time, such as Ohio Pile and Cook Forest. All of these parks offer beautiful scenery and plenty of activities to keep you busy. I personally love Ohio Pile and I do a lot of fly fishing down there. This is where my story takes place. I was camping with just my wife this summer. This took place in June. We had sent our kids to stay with their grandparents in central PA for a week in the summer, so the wife and I could get to do what we love to do most, which is camping. We have a few families that we normally go camping with when we have the kids, but this time it was just us. I have a bunkhouse travel trailer that sleeps eight. We were camping at Ohio Pile State Park. We got there on Saturday and set up our spot, then headed down to the Yakagani River to fish. I love the fly fish and so does the wife. So that's what we did all day until it was time to cook dinner and eat. After my dinner, my wife wanted to walk down to the river. It was about a mile away or so until you get to an area where there's some large boulders along the river. We just sat there and enjoyed nature. We sat on those rocks until it got dark 
and then headed back to our camp with our flashlights. My wife was walking ahead of me and we were about halfway back to the camp when all of a sudden my wife stops and pointed her flashlight at something on the trail about 20 feet ahead of us. I stopped too because I didn't know what she had seen, but when I shined my light at where she was pointing, I couldn't believe what I saw. About 20 feet in front of us was this large creature with long hair. It was on all fours. It had its back to us so we couldn't see its face, but it looked like it was eating something on the trail. My first thought was that we just ran into a black bear, because we've encountered them before, but this looked different. For one, it took a second, but the smell hit us all at once. It smelled like a wet dog and urine so bad. It was a very pungent smell. This thing had black fur all over its body, but it was much different because it had hind legs like a dog and not a bear. It was also much larger than a black bear, at least any black bear that I've ever seen. It had this big hump on the back of its neck. As soon as we hit it with a flashlight, about a half a second later it takes off. I never saw its face. All of this happened in a flash. It was feeding on a raccoon that was half eaten on the trail. I'm not 100% sure what this thing was because it happened so fast and it just took off as soon as we saw it. I was never able to see its face, but it sure felt like that dog creature you talk about on your channel. I would love to know if anyone else in the Western PA region has seen this creature. Only being a rookie on the search and rescue, I was deeply disturbed by my findings. I was assigned to the crime scene where I had found a dismembered body abandoned on the side of the road. Nevertheless, I was grateful for any experiences that would help me grow as a wildlife officer, and I knew that this experience would provide excellent training opportunities. The victim's head and limbs were scattered across several yards from each other. Due to this fact, we weren't able to determine the animal responsible. The one huge drawback to this was the further that we investigated, it didn't match any known killing of any local wildlife that we knew. Usually we were able to identify teeth and bite marks, scratches and claw marks. There might be fur of an actual animal here that we tested, but it's not making any sense because nothing came up as a match in our vast systems. No one could identify the clump of orange looking matted fur that was left by the victim's head. The worst of the matter, it almost looked as if the head and limbs were ripped from the body. Not mauled or torn with teeth or claws, ripped using brute strength. Now you tell me, what the hell kind of animal would be able to do that? Once the police and medical examiner came, removing the body and any evidence, we were able to further explore the area. Since I was only a rookie, I had to tag along with one of the older guys. And to be honest, I was okay with that. I wasn't sure I was going to get the sight of that body out of my mind for a very long time. The boss told us that we had to check the area. Until that point, I didn't even know we split the area by letters. And before I could even glean any more information, we were off. I noticed that the ranger I was with had made sure the rifle was loaded and ready before we ever headed off. We drove around a bit taking the truck through the woods until we got to a far denser part of the parkland that I had never seen before. The ranger just sat there with the engine idling for a bit, looking into the trees in front of us, which were way too close together to drive through. It was weird, but I would have sworn there was something like fear in his eyes. This is as far as I go, he told me. Not only because the truck can't get through, but we don't belong out there. Of course, I had to ask what he meant by that, so I asked him, What do you mean, don't belong? Rangers can't go. It's a private land. He looked at me and replied real seriously that people can't go in there and it wasn't just exclusive to rangers. I wanted to ask more, but his silence seemed to imply that that was the end of the conversation. At least for now, and although it seemed to be a real odd thing to say, I didn't think too much of it, not right then anyway. We drove back to the ranger station, 
having scouted the area and not seen anything else suspicious, or indeed anything else at all. There didn't seem to be any deer, rabbits, or even a bird in sight. There was a strange atmosphere back at the station too. Even though I was still quite new, they'd always treated me as part of the team and keen and eager to take me under their wing to help me learn the ropes. I had been told many stories and most of them had humorous anecdotes and when they did something silly which they could laugh about after. But this was different. They didn't seem to want to include me. There were lots of looks passed between them as if there were something they all knew except me. I couldn't work out what was going on. I was still feeling jittery from the gory discovery and the fact that no one seemed to know what the hell kind of creature had caused such devastation. I yelled out, so what's with all the secret looking stuff not going into the woods? I mean, what do you think is out here? A Bigfoot? A Wendigo? Don't tell me there's a UFO hotspot, right? The room had gone silent, with the boss looking back over at me from his desk. I wasn't sure if I was going to get reprimanded, but he unlocked his drawer and pulled out a map and some various case files. Over the next hour or so, he and the others told me about different incidents they had attended to over the years. Discoveries that they had made, either that hadn't ended up on the official system or had been closed with a fake clarification. The category they were really fouled under was unexplained. Looking in the files and the photos, a lot of the bodies were in a similar state to the victim that I had found. Head and limbs torn from the torso, but despite numerous bite marks on the body, fur and feces found nearby, they couldn't match the animal with anything they'd come across before. Of course, even though I'd grown up reading Goosebumps and watching Supernatural, I didn't actually believe in anything unexplained. The notion was ridiculous. Must be some sort of hybrid predator. Like a wolf and a cougar had somehow produced offspring. Now the boss told me the DNA blood tested at the scene had no similarities with any other animal. Except one he had told me. He pulled out a sheet of paper from the file and then the printout from the blood found today. It was a match. So the same creature had attacked the latest victim and the person in this older file. Maybe all the files. Then I noticed the anomaly. The one creature it had something in common with. Human. So I asked if a person did this. But it couldn't be if they really thought a human being was responsible. Why are they looking into it and not the police? I mean, why not the FBI if there were this many blatant cases? But he told me it wasn't a person, and the DNA says it was definitely not human, but maybe at some point it was. I can't really explain how that made me feel or what I was thinking. It did go through my mind that maybe this was some sort of elaborate prank or initiation that someone would shout gotcha, but it never came. Needless to say, the case was closed very fast. I'm guessing the file ended up in a locked drawer along with the others. For the next few weeks, we all had to double up when we went out, especially if it was dark or when we were heading off the pass. We had to keep the campgrounds and the trail shut to the public too. I still haven't seen a deer or even a rabbit. All of the birds seem to be back, but there's something out there for sure. But for now, it remains unexplained. Hi Donovan, I'm submitting a story on behalf of my friend. She went hiking at Yosemite National Park in June of this year. She's actually an avid hiker. She's in her 50s and is really an outdoorsy person. She hikes a few times a week and recommends hiking gear on her blog for some side income. She's not easily scared or intimidated by nature. We've known each other for about 10 years. I told her to come forward with her story, but she's just too embarrassed of what people would think if she told her story, so I'm submitting it for her. She hikes during the week because it's less crowded, and she typically works weekends for her full-time job. She said she arrived early morning and started hiking the Yosemite Falls Trail. About 40 minutes into her hike, she starts hearing these weird noises coming from off the trail. 
She said it sounded like a squealing or a squeaking noise. She thought it was odd, but she just kept hiking. Shortly after, she could see something following her, off to the right of the trail behind her. She kept looking back, but whatever this was would hide behind some brush or trees every single time she looked back. At this point, she was getting a little nervous that it could be a mountain lion stalking her, although it was uncommon for them to be out during the day. She would frequently look back, but she never saw anything, until she falls over and lands face first on the trail. She felt something push her from behind that had claws. It was really strong, like if a grown man shoved you as hard as they could. She cut up her hands and knees on the trail and scraped her face on the dirt and rocks. Then she hears this loud cackling sound coming from right behind her. Her phone also fell out of her pocket when she was shoved to the ground. She grabs her phone and turns around and sees this animal standing four to maybe four and a half feet tall. It was standing on its hind legs and covered in this light brown fur. It had feet like a wolf or a dog, but it had these big claws on the end. It also had long arms and claws that were a few inches long. It was small and muscular, but it had large pectoral muscles for its size. It had this smashed in face with kind of a pig shaped nose with teeth hanging out of its mouth. The scariest part of all was its eyes. She said they were glowing this orangish color even though it was in the day. She was scared, but she managed to somehow capture this photo of it before she took out her pepper spray and sprayed this thing. It was standing there looking over her with drool coming out of its mouth, and it was turning its head like it was trying to figure out what to do next. It was obviously a foot smaller than my friend, but way more powerful than her. Even though you can't see its face, I still can't believe she was able to snap this picture. She always carries her pepper spray on her belt on her left side. Right after she snapped the picture, she grabbed her pepper spray as it was moving its head around and sprayed it. It let out this very loud cackle, and then it went stumbling, then eventually running off into the woods. Luckily, she didn't suffer from any serious injuries, just some scratches on her back and some bruising on her knees and hands. She was able to get back to her car okay and made it home. She called me on the way home and told me what had happened. Like I said, this happened in June, and she hasn't hiked alone since then, and probably never will again. Thanks for getting these stories out there. My friend will be happy if she gets to hear this story on your channel. Thanks and God bless, Donna. My search and rescue experience is not specific to a park, rangers, or even emergency service. I've been fortunate enough to be exposed to many different situations all throughout my short career. The following are quick stories about some of those incidents. I've only been a ranger now for two years and before that, I spent another five years in the military as an infantryman. All that I know is combat, but working with civilians has taught me valuable lessons on how to take charge. Like how I wish we had increased the search area on this case a lot sooner, and before the weather had changed. It's the weirdest and most frightening experience I've ever had, despite seeing action in the army. Because there's never a rational explanation for what happened to those women. The three ladies in question were hiking along a well-traveled trail up to Mount Rainier when they went missing. On the fifth day, it started snowing very hard and there was no sign of them anywhere. One of their boyfriends had called in claiming that the women were all young and fit and healthy. They were experienced hikers. Even if the weather had taken the most unexpected turn, there was no GPS from any of them and hadn't been since the second day. If it had been snowing the entire time, I would have been more inclined to expect to find the frozen bodies. But the snow had only just begun. Now that the snow had added to the problem, it should not have been the cause. I headed up to the last place one of them had used a call and relocated the GPS signal, then followed the trail myself until I reached their intended finish and rendezvous point. There was indeed no sign 
or anything. The snow was now covering any tracks that I might have been able to spot. I spent the entire day exploring the area as much as the weather would allow me to, checking above me the whole time. You'd be surprised how many clues there are in the trees that regular people might miss. But no, I couldn't find a thing. It was like those three women just found a hole in the ground and were sucked in. Snow had continued to fall for the next four days, and we gave up much hope of ever finding them alive. Even if they had managed to crawl into some space that I didn't know existed, they would have likely had frozen to death by now anyway. On the fourth day, so now nine days since they were supposed to finish the trail, the weather now grew warmer and snow began to melt some. So I headed back out taking one of the dogs with me. Old Shep was a cadaver dog, trained to sniff out corpses. As I said, I wasn't expecting to find any of those ladies alive. I'm sure you already figured out the story won't have a happy ending. But first off, old Shep did find something like what I had been expecting. A leg. One cleanly amputated left leg. No boot or clothing, just a leg. A leg that aside from no longer being attached to its owner was perfectly fine. Not bruised, not gashed, no bite marks. Then we found one of the women just walking on the trail. I immediately called for an airlift covering her in warm blankets and giving her fluids. She was still fully dressed in her hiking clothes, no visible cuts or bruises. You could tell just by looking at her that she was in shock and suffering from hypothermia, and she appeared to be starving. Her pack and cell were missing, despite me trying to find out if she knew where the others were. She was unable or unwilling to talk. Once at the hospital, they checked her over, but couldn't find any physical or long-term injuries or issues. No frostbite, no flesh wounds, nothing. As soon as she was warm and had eaten, she was asked a ton of questions, but nothing. She spent months in the hospital just recovering. Having been moved onto the psych ward pretty early to my knowledge, was barely able to communicate at all, let alone give an explanation. We never found any more of the second woman other than that leg, and nothing at all of the third woman, nor their packs or cells or any belongings. It just disappeared. But the scariest part, the part that makes no sense, even less sense than three fit and healthy women going out onto a well-used trail and only one coming back, is that this is not the first occurrence of a group of people just disappearing and only one returning without a scratch or mark on them. But no one has any reasonable explanation as to what could be the cause. This happened when we were going to the Redwoods in California. This was a very remote part of California, so there were no cell phones or any kind of communication that we could have used. The sun had not come up yet, and it was one of the most isolated parts of the state, or so it felt. I had been camping with five friends in a very deep patch of forest in Northern California. We spent our days hiking around the woods, huddling around campfires at night to keep warm. My friends and I were all experienced hikers, who thought we knew how to survive out in the wilderness. But this time we went off trail for an adventure hike to one of the longest areas which led into the heart of a mysterious part of the Redwood National Park. We assumed that it had remained unexplored by man for who knows how long. We knew we were getting deep into the remote areas, and the further we went, the more it became more of a green labyrinth of trees that grew thicker and denser towards the center. We told ourselves that if we got lost, it would be easier to find our way back by following our own footsteps until we bumped into a familiar landmark or area. Now the sun set about 6 p.m., giving us about six hours of sunlight left for hiking through this unknown charted part. As night approached, my friends decided they wanted to take a break from hiking, just to relax so they could recoup their energy for tomorrow's adventure. They built this huge fire and we sat around telling stories. The night forest became alive with strange shadows dancing on the trees but we kept our spirits high, telling stories of haunted places near where we lived back home. 
We talked about how frightening it would be if an axe murderer got into your house, or even out here in this dark wilderness, where absolutely nothing was familiar. We laughed at each other for being scared, and after a few minutes, one of my friends put on a song from Elvis Presley. We all started singing along to it. Afterwards, we all stared deep into the fire pit and began to talk more about what scary things are out there. I'm sure some of us were thinking about Bigfoot or other monsters that supposedly live out here. At first, we all kind of agreed nothing really scary lives out here, and we were just kind of freaking ourselves out. And then strange stories began to come out more and more. One friend said he knew a story of a ghost, apparently that lived up by a lake, and you could die just by looking into it. Yet another friend talked about how many people disappeared into Oregon's national parks, never to be seen again. They talked about hidden creatures deep in the cave systems, which people were being taken into. One of my friends even claimed he once saw Bigfoot while hiking through Nevada. Every time somebody told a new story or took the rabbit hole deeper, it would just freak us out even more. Then we'd laugh and make fun of each other for being scared. And we kept reassuring ourselves that there's nothing dangerous out here. But then, everybody would jump as we all heard a sudden noise, which sounded like it came from a large animal. And then there was silence. That's when I began to think about how scary this deep forest was actually becoming. And we were pretty far out there. I took my friend's story about Bigfoot seriously and started to tell them more ghost stories. I told them about this sandman who climbs through your windows while you're sleeping and steals your soul, never letting it return again. It's a character in children's books that comes out at night and puts dust on your eyes. My friends are like, whatever man, you're so full of crap. But I laughed and even got a little freaked out myself because they kept talking about things being in the woods. But then, one of my friends sees movement over by one of the trees, which is covered in a shadow. She screams and says it looked like somebody or something was trying to shake the tree behind it. We all look and to our horror, there is actually something there. This large figure moving behind the tree. My friend, thinking it was a trick of the light or dark, grabs his flashlight, shining it in that direction illuminating this partial figure, and just like out of a movie, we saw that this thing had these deep glowing eyes. That's when we all began screaming and jumping up from our camping spots and running to the tents. Some of us were grabbing weapons while others were huddling in the tents for safety. This thing was thrashing through the brush, wailing like the most twisted, terrible animal you could imagine. We turned on our flashlights, desperately trying to defend ourselves with the light in case it came at us. But really, what could that even do? Thankfully, we didn't see anything out there again that night. I can't sit here and say that I'm an expert about what we saw. We were terrified. Nobody else knew exactly what they were seeing either. But I've never been so frightened before in my entire life. And for days after that, everybody was talking about how scary those woods are. And where did that thing go? We knew we weren't imagining things. Because everybody saw it. Even I. And I was probably the least scared out of all of us. The weird thing is, is we never reported the incident. It was as if we all had mutually agreed that it wasn't our place to tell anybody. I mean, we were probably trespassing on private property. That's my story. I've always had a fascination with the deep woods. I grew up hearing stories of strange creatures like Bigfoot and critters like the Loveland Frogmen. Now, even as a kid, I was absolutely fascinated by these tales. Some people might think it's just kid stuff. But at night, when my parents would go to sleep, I could never fall asleep because all I could ever do was think about what lurks within the forbidden and mysterious forest that surrounded our tiny little town here in California. It had almost been 20 years since they tore down the old abandoned factory right near where we lived. So therefore, there weren't any more scary urban legends for me to be deathly afraid of. 
My parents said it used to be an evil place where bad people did things like satanic rituals, animal sacrifices, that sort of thing. The story they told me though was of a man whose daughter got kidnapped while playing in the woods by something they referred to as the man with no face. Supposedly he had no face, and if you ever saw him, you would die. They just used to scare me with that story. I mean, I guess my fascination with scary stories and experiences, it began pretty early on in life. As a kid, I really wanted to have an encounter with some sort of being from beyond. Growing up there were many times we went camping or hiked into what anybody would call the deep woods with friends or hiking excursions or even hunting and fishing. I've done it all. My father said that this particular forest area here in Cali was once thriving with bears and other wild critters. I always thought that was pretty cool. He said in the early 1800s it was actually one of the largest uncut forests in all of Cali and there were thousands of buffalo roaming. My parents would tell me things like this in hopes to keep me out of the forest. They knew how fascinated I was with them, but sometimes my brain just couldn't stop thinking about what lived deep within its mysterious walls. I would sneak off for an hour or two by myself. The area I live in is similar to a haunted woods type setting. Lots of creeks, some of which run through waterfalls, old abandoned homes, and factories. Small lakes and big rocks and boulders, and sometimes hidden caves, and other natural formations with cool names like the Devil's Slide and Devil's Punch Bowl. It's a very secluded area that hardly anybody ever goes to. I mean, it's so hard to get to. But I'm sure if you put in the time to get there, you would for sure have an encounter with something. I remember one day after hours of fishing on this particular lake that is surrounded by woods on both sides, which pretty much describes any lake, right? Gosh, I'm terrible at descriptions, but I digress. There weren't any birds chirping or squirrels running around. The forest had gone silent, pretty disturbing, on top of all that, we noticed how unusually dreary and foggy it had gotten all of the sudden. This was a warm day with a clear, beautiful sky, just not even 30 minutes prior. It wasn't even foggy in this area. So where did this come from? I think maybe we get about two days a year where you can't even see past 20 feet. This was strange. We all figured it was some sort of, well, we don't know. I guess I'm not really sure what to even come up with. I really have nothing to explain it. So we ended packing up and heading back towards the car. We took this as our sign to abandon ship. The path we took through the woods were on both sides very thick, lots of overgrowth, bushes, and brush. Now on your left, there was this old abandoned dilapidated house. Then to your right, lots of full rocks and boulders. And eventually, if you went to path, it would actually take you to a cool waterfall. In that moment, I was so wrapped up in my own thoughts that my friend and I didn't even notice the figure. It slowly came closer, and when we finally noticed, we saw this eerie black figure walking towards us from another path. We got a really bad feeling instantly we stopped and looked at each other, wondering what this thing could be and waited there for it to come and get us. In that moment, I could feel my heart beating out of my chest, but I couldn't run. Something inside me was telling me that if I ran, this thing was going to catch us. Now to describe to you what on earth this thing was, I can't. It was glitchy if that makes sense, electrical. It looked like a living, moving, physical shadow of a man with an electrical outline. Or kind of like what happens to a VHS tape when it glitches, like very staticky. It's terrifying. I mean, it made no sound, but you could feel this thing's energy projected onto us. We fled without even hesitating another second, somehow able to fully convince our bodies to run. Now this thing continued to pursue us. We ran and ran, paying no mind to if this thing was really pursuing us further. I think at one point or another, I think we lost it. 
We had stopped to catch our breath and the forest around us had begun to come back alive. I remember hearing the birds and thinking, oh, that's a wonderful sign, but the eeriness was still there. The feeling you could cut with a knife of dread was still lingering. We knew we couldn't stop in this spot for long. We were quickly looking around, just in case this thing decided to show itself again. Like I said, the forest was so thick, you couldn't see past 10 feet in front of you. It's amazing how something as dangerous and terrifying as what we just saw could blend right into its environment. We made it out alive and in one piece, they would say. We never talked about it after that, but my friend and I still talk about it to this day. At least we didn't talk about it for a long time afterwards. So only recently we have begun to talk about it again. Hopefully that's not too confusing and you understand me. Anyway, we mentioned to each other and recounted the events just to make sure either of us were not crazy. We both remember it the same as the other. I'll leave you with some advice. If you ever find yourself walking alone to the woods on any given day, don't be so sure that there aren't paranormal entities around you. I had a very terrifying thing happen to me two weeks ago when I was camping in the Appalachian Mountains. Before I get to this story, I need to provide a little background on why I was in the Appalachian Mountains. I'm very into wilderness survival and bushcraft. I have been for the last few years. I've honed my skills and take any chance I get to put them in use in the wild. So when my friend told me he found this great spot in the Appalachian Mountains, I was all for it. I met my friend through a Facebook group about bushcraft and survival. His name is Alex and he's from North Carolina. We hit it off immediately because of our shared interest in the outdoors. We had both been planning to go on this camping trip for weeks and we were both very excited when the day finally arrived. We drove up to the mountains and hiked to our spot. We were in a beautiful clearing with a stream running nearby. We planned to camp for two weeks to practice our bushcrafting skills. The first week went by without any incident. We were having a great time. We were catching fish from the stream to eat. On the morning of the eighth day, my friend got a call from his brother saying that his mother went into the hospital. His brother told him that she wasn't doing well and he needed to come home immediately. I was really worried about my friend and his mom, but I didn't want him to go alone. I offered to go with him, but he refused and told me just to continue on with the trip. That's exactly what I did. I helped my friend pack up his things and I said goodbye. I was now alone in the wilderness, which wasn't new to me because I've done plenty of solo camps before. We were very deep in the back country of the Smoky Mountains. We didn't see anyone the entire time we were out here. I was used to the solitude, but this time it felt very different. I can't explain it, but I had this feeling like something bad was going to happen. I tried to shake the feeling, but it just wouldn't go away. I decided to set up my hammock for the night and get some sleep. I was awoken in the middle of the night by this loud crash. It sounded like something large had fallen nearby. I sat up in my hammock and listened carefully, but there was only silence. I strained my eyes in the darkness, but I couldn't see anything. I slowly got out of my hammock and grabbed my flashlight and knife from my pack. I shined the light in the direction of the noise, but I still couldn't see anything. I began to walk towards the noise when I heard it again, but this time it sounded like it was coming from behind me. I turned around and flashed the light in that direction, but there was nothing there. I ran into our survival shelter that we built and just sat there with the door shut. Thank God we made a makeshift door. Now this survival shelter wasn't bear proof, but it kept me hidden. I sat there for hours just waiting and listening to this thing circle the shelter. I could hear it breathing and it smelled awful. I wanted to gag from the smell of it. I literally sat there for three hours with my knife in hand, ready to defend myself if this thing tried to break into the shelter. It would come and go over that time. I would hear it, then there would be silence. Then I could hear it breathing again. Sometimes it made this grunting noise. It would get close to the shelter, then walk away. 
It was almost like it was taunting me. I had no idea what this thing was, but I knew it wasn't human and it wasn't any animal I've ever smelled before. The sun finally started to come up and through the shelter I could see the silhouette of this thing walking away through the woods. It was massive. It was walking on its hind legs. I waited for a few minutes and then I cautiously stepped out of the shelter. There was no sign of it anywhere. However, it did leave behind this tuft of fur. As you can see in the pictures I sent, there is a patch of fur that was lying on the ground. It's dark brown and it has this reddish tinge to it. It's like a hand-sized clump of fur and it smelled awful. I took two pictures of it and both pictures are attached to this email. I knew this had to be a Sasquatch, so I called the park ranger's office and told them my location. It took them about an hour to get there. It was only one ranger who came, but he collected the hair samples and put them into a plastic bag. He was asking me all kinds of questions and I ran through what I just said that this thing was hanging around my campsite all night and smelled awful. I told him that I saw it leaving when the sun came up. After I packed everything up, he hiked back with me to my car. About 200 yards from our campsite, on the way out of there, he found this huge pile of scat. He was very intrigued by it. I've never seen scat like that before. He also collected that and put it in this large plastic bag. He took my information and told me that he would follow up with me when they found out what this was. I haven't heard anything from him yet. I'll let you know when and if I do hear from him. Hi Donovan, I'm not sure if this is the kind of story you would want on your channel, but I decided to share it anyway. This happened at the beginning of summer. It was a couple weeks later when I first saw one of your YouTube videos. It was kind of reassuring to hear stories from others who've experienced something supernatural. I wasn't sure at first what I experienced was really supernatural, and I'm still not exactly sure what it was but I'll explain it as well as I can. I love hiking and trail running, and I spend a lot of time in the woods. I usually hike with my wife or sometimes a friend, but tend to run alone because I'm usually training for some race. I have a trail marathon coming up soon, so I've been training a lot. It's hot here in the southeast, so in the summer I get up early and usually start my runs at daybreak or before. It was a Monday, so I didn't have a lot of time to get my run in. I had to jump on a Zoom call. I couldn't miss this meeting and wanted to have some time to prep before the meeting. This was only my second team meeting since I got promoted to Director of Product Management. Ever since the pandemic, my company has been more relaxed with people working from home. I still go into the office Tuesday through Thursday, but they wanted us to keep these Monday morning meetings to start the week as a team. I decided I could do a quick six miler that morning if I started in the dark and planned to run a few miles in the evening if I could. Since I started earlier than usual, it was still really dark out. I was wearing my headlamp to make sure I didn't trip or run into anything out there. It was a surprisingly cool morning and I quickly got into the rhythm of my run and was kind of just zoning out, which I could do on this trail since I'd run it so many times. I was running up the first hill when I heard something, but I wear those bone conduction ones when I run so I can hear what's going on around me. It wasn't a loud sound, but it was definitely out of place in the woods. It was like a loud humming sound. At first, I thought there was something wrong with my headphones, but when I got to the top of the hill, I saw where the sound was coming from. I knew it was the sound source, but I didn't know what I was looking at. It was this glowing circle right there in the woods. I tried to think of a rational explanation for what I was seeing, and my first thought was that it was some kind of portal. I didn't even know what a portal was. Of course, I've seen them in movies, you know, like Doctor Strange and stuff, but here in the middle of the woods? Then I thought no one, especially my wife, will believe me if I don't have proof. I also wanted to have evidence for myself because I thought for sure I must have been dreaming or hallucinating or something. So I grabbed my phone and snapped a picture. 
Then I just stood there staring at this circle for I don't even know how long. I couldn't even tell what was on the other side. I realized that I needed to get on with my run. I looked at my watch and it was glitching, which is something my reliable Garmin had never done. It was blinking like it was losing its charge. I grabbed my cell phone and it was now completely dead. It had a full charge when I started, so that didn't seem right. Thank God I had the picture. No one would believe this. At least I hope I had captured it on photo. I knew I had to get going. I didn't want to get any closer to this thing, whatever it was. I was already too close, I thought, maybe six feet away. I didn't want to get sucked into another dimension or anything like that, which I know sounds crazy, but I was looking at this glowing circle in the woods, so I didn't know what to think. There was no way I was going to touch it, but I had to know what happened if something went through the circle. I took my water bottle and tossed it through. The bottle just vanished in thin air. The circle closed and it was gone. I looked at my watch and it was working fine. I grabbed my phone out of my pocket, but it was still dead. Okay, I just saw a portal in the woods. Maybe. Again, I wasn't even really sure what a portal was or why it would be there. I can tell you I ran fast back to my car. Not only because I didn't want to be late for my work meeting, but even more so because I couldn't wait to charge my phone and see the picture to prove what I had seen was real. When I got in my car, I remembered I had taken the charging cable out of my car when I was out the other night to use my battery pack, so I had to wait until I got home. As soon as I ran into the house, I immediately plugged in my phone. My wife made some comment about me being late. I started to tell her about what I had seen. She laughed and told me that I watched too much TV. I guess she realized I wasn't joking because she stopped laughing and said, what are you talking about? Finally, my phone powered on and I opened the photos. There it was. I showed her and she thought it was as weird as I did. I told her about the humming sound, but the weirdest part was the water bottle. I didn't have time to prep for the meeting but luckily it went pretty smoothly. My wife, who also works at home as a recruiter, must not have had a lot of work to do that day because she spent all day reading Reddit posts and researching portals. I think she was kind of jealous that she didn't get to see it, or maybe she just really didn't believe me and wanted to see it for herself. I decided to skip my run that evening and my wife and I went out to that same spot to see what we could find. As soon as we walked up the hill, I realized there was nothing there, nothing at all. I don't mean there was nothing unusual there. I mean there was just nothing at all. Like all the grass, leaves, and roots, everything at that spot was burnt away. I've been back on that trail many times this summer and haven't seen this thing again, or really anything strange. I know my story isn't as crazy as some that you've heard, but to me, it was definitely something something supernatural. I don't know if it really was a portal, and if it was, where it led. I know my water bottle disappeared right before my eyes, and I have the picture which proves at least to me that it was there. Maybe someone else has seen something similar or has more insight. I would love to hear from someone else who has seen something like this. Thanks, Donovan, and keep telling our stories. Hi Donovan, this happened about 15 years ago at my first job right out of high school. I had to change some of the names and details of the story for obvious reasons. I got my first full-time job working at a state-run animal laboratory testing facility. I was told that mostly we were testing livestock and wildlife specimens. We were searching for communicable diseases which can wipe out a large animal stock or make humans sick from consumption. As an office assistant, I wasn't actually directly involved in any of the testing as I wasn't trained as a lab tech. So I was responsible for filing reports as we still used paper files back then. I answered the phones on the rare occasion it rang and also transported samples throughout the building. It wasn't a bad place to work and my job was pretty easy. Although it was sometimes kind of a boring place to work, the people who worked there were a pretty entertaining group. 
Even though this was a state facility, it certainly didn't have the feel of a government building. It was an old building, with a small sign on the door. We all had to swipe our ID cards to get into the building, but other than that, there weren't any security measures in place. Sometimes the security system would be out of order, and we would just prop the main door open with a brick or something. So like I said, it wasn't very secure. I had worked there for just a little over a year when things started to get kind of weird. We got an email on a Friday informing us that beginning on Monday, there would be some new security measures in place. These included the installation of metal detectors, personal cell phones were not allowed anywhere in the building, and everyone would be issued a new ID badge which would allow access only to areas of the building necessary for your job. And of course, common areas such as restrooms and break rooms we all had access to. Also, it said that under no circumstances were any doors to be propped open, and failure to follow these protocols would result in immediate termination. This all seemed a little extreme for a lab testing dead animals but I thought maybe it was just a change to all state government buildings to make everything more secure. Badge access would be required to enter and exit the building. It went on to say that in an emergency, such as a fire, the exits would open, which didn't really make sense to me. Why did we need to use our badge to exit the building? Again, looking back, this might have been a red flag that something weird was going on. But at the time, I just thought it would be annoying, but otherwise not that big of a deal. It was a week or two after the new security measures that I had a strange encounter with a coworker. At the time, it didn't really seem all that alarming, but later on I would learn how alarming it really was. I came out of the bathroom door and almost got run over by Josh, one of the lab techs who worked in Lab 4. Lab 4 was the only part of the building that I had never seen even before the new security was in place. I never had any specimens to be delivered to Lab 4, and I hardly ever saw any of the lab techs from that room throughout the day. I only knew Josh because we always seemed to arrive at work at the same time and park close to each other on most days, so we would end up walking into the building together. Josh wasn't much of a talker, so when I say I knew him, really, I just knew who he was. That day, Josh was sprinting down the hall when he almost leveled me. I said something like, Wow, who's chasing you? And he replied with something like, You don't want to know. I always thought Josh was a little odd anyway, so I thought he was just trying to be dramatic or something. Josh never came back to work after that day. I asked around if anyone knew what had happened to him or where he went. No one seemed to know. It was really strange for someone just to quit or be fired and no one to ever talk about it. I didn't know how to contact Josh and we weren't really friends so I just assumed something set him off or he either quit or got fired and that's why I saw him running out of the building. I never saw someone run that fast though just to leave a job. It seemed more like he was running for his life or something, which now I assume he was or at least thought he was. It wasn't until my own mistake at the lab that I realized why Josh was running away. I was pushing a cart with some specimens from the refrigerated intake room to lab 3. I was so tired after not sleeping well the night before, and I felt like I was walking in a daze. I walked up to lab 3, which I had done probably a hundred times when I realized that the door to lab 4 was open just a crack. Curiosity got the best of me and I decided I needed to know what was in Lab 4. I pushed on the door as slowly as I could because I knew I was breaking protocol to look inside. I expected to see a typical lab with tables and machines like in the other three labs. This was nothing like the other labs. There were cages, giant cages reaching to the ceiling. They seemed to be electrified or glowing, I don't know and inside the cages were some kind of living creatures. We didn't test live animals in this building, just samples from animals. I don't even know if these were animals. I don't know for sure how many there were, probably eight or 10 of them. When I say they were terrifying, that doesn't begin to describe them. They were black, but not solid black color. It was more like a moving pattern on their skin 
if it was skin. They were so tall, probably at least eight or nine feet tall. Maybe taller because they were all kind of bent or folded over themselves. They had projections like arms or legs, which were moving around and seemed to almost disappear at times before coming back into view. They were sort of squid or octopus-like, but seemed to have an almost human-like quality I can't describe. There was also this very loud humming, high-pitched sound, which I think was coming from these creatures, but maybe not. I was still trying to take it all in when one of the closest to the door turned its head towards me. I immediately felt the most painful throbbing in my head. It wasn't a headache or even a migraine, and I was unfortunately very familiar with migraine pain. It was like a searing pain I can't even describe. I thought for sure my brain was coming out or being pulled out of my head and I was dying. In fact, for a moment I hoped I was dying so the pain would stop. The face of that creature, if you could call it a face, was pure evil. The eyes were only these narrow black slits. It opened what I assumed was its mouth, and something started to come out as if it were turning inside out. I couldn't breathe and I fell to the floor. A man who I had never seen before came running toward me and pushed me out of the way and slammed the door shut. An alarm sounded and a security guard immediately grabbed me and escorted me quite forcibly straight to my supervisor's office. My supervisor, who I will call Denise, didn't look at me. She just said, you were obviously terminated immediately. You may think you saw something out there and you may feel tempted to talk about it. I would not do that if I were you. I mean, not that there was anything out there. You are clearly not feeling well and seem very feverish and have been hallucinating. I will not mention your insubordination to future employers as long as I have no reason to do so. Now I will take your name badge and the guard will escort you to your car. I don't know how I drove home that day. When I got home, my mom asked me what was wrong. I didn't have the strength for a conversation about it, so I didn't tell her I was fired. I told her I wasn't feeling well and went straight to bed. I slept for well over 24 hours. My mom said she checked on me several times to make sure I was still breathing. When I finally woke up, I was so disoriented. At first, I thought it was all a dream. I couldn't wrap my head around what had happened. Since I didn't get to see any of my friends on the way out of work that day, I wanted to know what was going on. I called my two friends from work that day and several times over the next week. They never answered my calls and I eventually got voicemails from them separately. Their messages were so similar and it sounded almost like they were reading instead of just talking. Basically, they both said that they hoped I was feeling better, but it was probably for the best that we not hang out anymore, since we didn't work together anymore, and they each asked me never to contact them again. It was so strange. We were friends. Like, not just at work. I was fired and lost two of my best friends, and I didn't know why. One night, several years after the incident, I couldn't sleep which wasn't unusual for me after that day at the lab. I couldn't get Josh out of my mind. It took me a while to remember his last name. I thought maybe he was on Facebook or I could find an address for him if he still lived in the state. I finally found an address and realized he lived only 10 miles from me. I decided I would go see him that weekend. I just really wanted to talk to someone who might be able to give me some insight into what I had seen that day. Saturday morning, I started driving to his house. I almost turned around several times because I knew it was weird for me to show up at his house years later and we weren't even really friends when we worked together. But mostly, I think I didn't know if I wanted to know the truth about what was in that room. I finally decided that the worst thing that could happen would be Josh would slam the door in my face. When I got to his house, I rung the bell and waited. Finally, a woman opened the door. She looked like she was about Josh's age. Was Josh married? I introduced myself and I told her I was looking for a guy I used to work with named Josh and thought this was his address. She looked surprised, then looked down and she introduced herself as Amy, Josh's wife. She said, I'm sorry, Josh passed away almost a year ago. She told me to come inside that she'd love to talk about Josh 
and had never even met any of his work friends. I didn't tell her that we weren't exactly friends. I felt like Amy really wanted to talk, and I did want to find out about what happened to Josh, so I followed her inside. As soon as we sat down, she started asking me questions about Josh. I realized that she had a lot of unanswered questions, which I guess she thought I could answer. She said she didn't know why Josh had quit his job at the lab so suddenly. She said it was unlike him to do anything spontaneous. I asked her what he had said, and she told me that was what she didn't understand. Josh talked so much about everything else, but he would never talk about why he quit his job. She said he seemed to be more distant after he quit his job, and she was worried about him. Before that day, apparently, Josh was social and always the life of the party, or at least that's how Amy described him. I realized then that I really didn't know anything about Josh. She thought something bad must have happened at work, but he never told her a thing. She told me that Josh suddenly became interested in alien life forms. Did I know anything about Josh's interest in that? Of course not, as I didn't really even know Josh, but I told her that that was something that we talked about. She said he became almost obsessed. He joined online groups and was always chatting with others about alien encounters and abductions. He was even starting to write a book about aliens. She said it was so unlike him to be so interested in science fiction as he always made fun of people who believed in anything supernatural and that it seemed like he wasn't just interested but was also starting to believe it. She said she tried to be supportive in his new writing career but it was hard because he was just becoming so different from the man she had married. I was feeling uncomfortable with how much she was sharing, since she obviously thought Josh and I were closer than we were. She went on to tell me that Josh was diagnosed with cancer within months of quitting his job at the lab. She said the doctors couldn't even really identify what kind of cancer it was. He had been to several top cancer centers, and no one, even the experts, could make a definitive diagnosis. She said his cancer initially responded to chemotherapy, and he was considered to be in remission for a little over a year when the cancer returned. This time it had already ravaged his entire body, and he lived only a few weeks after it came back. This was a lot to take in. Then she asked me if I wanted to read the book he had started writing. I said sure, so she went to the bedroom to go get it. I realized then that my heart was racing and I thought I was about to have a panic attack. When she handed me the unfinished book, I did have that panic attack. Before I even read any words, I saw a picture what he had drawn. She could see my panic and said, I know it's unnerving, isn't it? It wasn't unnerving. It was terrifying and exactly what I had seen in those cages in the lab. I began reading the pages which he described in detail the creatures, which were not of this world. He then described how a man was taken in by the alien, not exactly abducted but enveloped within the creature itself. It then spit him out so to speak but the man continued to suffer with pain and hallucinations. I had to stop reading. I had to get out of there. I told her I wasn't feeling well. I apologized and thanked her as I rushed out the door. I didn't and still don't want to know anymore. In fact, I wish I had never gone there. I realized I didn't need more information. I wish I had never opened that lab door. I realized there was no answer that would make me feel better, no truth that would stop the nightmare, so that's where I left it. I have found that as much as I try to forget it, telling my story and Josh's story does help me in some strange way. I don't know any more about what is going on in that lab, and I was glad when my mom told me the lab was shut down and that old building was demolished. It was replaced by a luxury condo complex. I went to school for accounting. I moved out of state and I've been working in a very stable and unexciting accounting firm for the past eight years. I still have nightmares, but they are becoming less frequent. Thanks for listening and helping me to share my story. Hi Donovan, big fan of the show. I recently found your channel because I've been fascinated with the supernatural and the paranormal 
Ever since I've been involved in a case that was so strange that it puzzles me to this very day. I'll get into the details of the case in a second because I have some photos to go along with it that I put in this Word document. It was too confusing to attach them since I'll be referring to the actual evidence. This happened roughly five years ago, and the case went cold a year after the incident, since we never found an answer or even an explanation. First off, I'm a retired detective with the NYPD, and now I do private investigation work part-time. I've been working for myself for the last eight years since retiring from the force. I've thoroughly enjoyed my retirement because I can work as much or as little as I want, which my wife greatly appreciates because when I was with the NYPD, I was working 60 to 70 hours a week at times. So this case got me back to that point of working long hours just because I couldn't explain what happened. Before I get into the case, a little background on me. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, a lifetime New Yorker and proud of it. I always wanted to be a detective and to solve crime ever since I was a young boy. I guess it was from watching cop shows when I was a kid. My dad, who was also a district attorney, might have had something to do with it too. He would always tell me about the cases he was working. Of course, he wouldn't share any of the details of the gruesome cases or anything like that. I worked hard in school and got good grades. I knew from a very young age exactly what I wanted to do. I guess I was fortunate in that aspect because my kids are not the same way I was. I never got in any trouble when I was young or even in my adult life. After I graduated from high school, I went to college and got a degree in criminal justice. I applied to the NYPD and I was accepted. I worked my way up the ranks and eventually became a detective. I worked in the homicide division and I saw a lot of terrible things as you can imagine. Also, growing up in Brooklyn kind of gives you a little bit of a different perspective on life. I retired from the police department over eight years ago and now I'm a private investigator. I mostly do mundane work but sometimes I get involved in some interesting cases. This one I'm about to share is one of them. It's the most interesting or should I say, strangest case I've ever been a part of. I still have a lot of contacts in the department and other places. I was contacted by a friend of mine who was a detective in the homicide division. He asked me to come down to the station and take a look at this case he was working on. He said it was very strange and he wanted another opinion. I went down to the station and he showed me the file. It was a strange case indeed. A man had been found dead in a warehouse in Queens. He had been drained of all of his blood and had these bite marks on his neck, chest, and thighs. I know what you're thinking, there's a vampire in New York City. Well, that's the first thing I thought of too, and you know what, it might not be far from the truth. But let me explain before you just dismiss this case or rush to any judgment. This man had been working out of this warehouse for the last five years. He was the only one who worked a night shift. Things became quite a mess on the warehouse floor from all of the movement and shipping and receiving going on in the daylight hours. His job was to clean up and prepare some shipments for the following morning when the daylight shift came in. He worked in the shipping and receiving department. He also worked from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. This incident occurred at 3.12 a.m. in the morning. The warehouse had an out-of-date CCTV type security system in place, so we were able to capture some pictures of various events throughout the night. This wasn't a traditional CCTV setup. This system took pictures every 30 seconds versus a continuous video stream that went to a hard drive. The first picture, there's really nothing happening. This was taken at approximately 3.02 a.m. on the second floor of the warehouse. This is camera one. There is a stairwell that leads down to the first floor behind these cardboard boxes on the lower left side of this picture. As you can see, the quality isn't the best, but that's what we had to go on. This next picture is what is disturbing and strange. There is a security camera in the stairwell leading up to the second floor. And at 3.04 a.m. it captures this shadowy figure who we will refer to as the perpetrator walking up the stairs, making the turn on the stairwell landing, 
and coming out on the second floor. I really wish I had better quality photos. Now from the looks of it, I can't really make out what this thing is. It could be a person, but it just doesn't look right to me. It looks as if the head is hunched down low and its arms are in an odd position for it to be a human. It's almost like it has very long hands. One minute later, this was captured on the second floor by camera five. We had all the cameras labeled as part of the investigation process. There was 12 cameras in total, but only a few of them caught the events that took place that night. Outside, they had four cameras that didn't capture anything. That's another part of this that is completely odd. After you turn the corner from coming up the stairs, where camera one is positioned, there are these old shelves that are broken down. It's basically a temporary holding area for trash that hasn't been moved out of the building yet. You can see the same figure walking down the warehouse floor on the east side of the building. Same hunched over position as the last capture we saw in the stairwell. But in this picture, it appears as if the legs are not solid. I attribute that to the camera because you'll see it in the next photo where we tried to enhance it. Now at the end of the east side of the building is where the victim is. There is a stairwell on the corner of the warehouse that accesses the first and second floor. This took place on the second floor. Because of the way the warehouse is positioned, the second floor is actually at street level, and the first floor is only a quarter of the building. It's basically a few offices, an elevator, and a stairwell that leads to the second floor. If you go down the east side of the warehouse to the opposite corner and make a right, there is a shipping and receiving office. This is where the actual crime takes place. The photo we tried to enhance and add color to as best as we could, at the far end of the east side of the building, which is about 100 feet outside of the shipping and receiving office. This is camera five, and you can tell that it doesn't look human. When we really zoom in on it, it appears as if it has larger eyes. It doesn't look more than four to five feet tall, from all of the pictures that we captured. You can see how it is crouched down and sitting on one knee and has its arm resting on its other leg, almost like it's ready to jump or take off. I'm thinking it just noticed the security camera at this point because in the picture, it appears as if it's looking up at the camera. Now this picture on camera six shows what we believe is the actual encounter. When the victim came face to face with the perpetrator, the victim was in his mid fifties and camera six was just outside of the shipping receiving office. You can see the door on the right side of the picture. The man appears to be pleading or negotiating with the perpetrator at this time. This is at 3:10 AM. There were signs of a struggle before the perpetrator finally overtook the victim. There were shelves that were knocked down and the area was a mess. There was nothing caught on camera after this point. We put the time of death at 3.12 AM. They found the victim the next morning lying on the floor completely drained of his own blood. These are some of the photos of the aftermath. We found some articles of clothing from the victim strewn across the floor, part of his shirt, boots, and socks. Although the victim lost a lot of blood during the attack, there were bite marks on his neck, chest, and right thigh, like his blood was purposefully being drained from his body. Definitely the strangest case I've ever been a part of. The victim didn't have any family, and both of his parents were deceased. There was no one to notify. Kind of sad, really. We racked our brains over this case for an entire year before it went cold. There were no fingerprints, no signs of forced entry, nothing. Only what we captured on the security cameras, which has me puzzled to this day, and that was five years ago. After this case, I started digging around on the web just for anything strange, and that's when I came across some various information about cryptids, demons, and other supernatural beings. I was never a believer in this stuff before, but I can't explain what happened in this case. There is something out there that is not human. I don't know what the motive was. Was it for pure pleasure? Did it just drift into this warehouse for some reason? 
Like I mentioned before, there's no pictures captured of it ever entering the building. Was it living inside of this warehouse somehow? These are all questions that I cannot answer. I don't know if I'll ever find an answer for them. I would love to know what really happened that night. Hi Donovan. First off, love the show. I've been a subscriber for a few months now. This is going to sound a little crazy and a little far out there, but I believe they are taking prisoners and doing experiments on them. Well, some are having experiments done, but some just leave and never come back. I'm a prison guard for a maximum security prison. I have been for the last eight years and I'm still working here. Obviously, I'm not going to divulge the details of where I work. I would be fired or maybe even worse, like disappear like some of the inmates. I've been working the night shift for about two years now. I'm not sure if it's just my prison or all of them, but there are things going on at night that no one knows about. At least no one who works during the day. There are two or four inmates that disappear every month or so. They are in their cell at lockdown at night, and the next morning, they're gone. What I believe is happening is that they are being taken, and experiments are being conducted on them. The reason I say this is there were a few inmates who came back, but they weren't the same. You could tell that they were different after they came back a few days later. The story for one of the inmates is that he got violent with one of the guards during lockdown, and they put him in the hole for three days. Now, I know this inmate well. We do get to know the inmates. He's not violent. Well, let's just say he's never shown any violence towards the guards, and has always been very compliant. His term was just about up, so why would you want to have any issues when your time is up? Anyways, he goes missing for three days, and some of the guards blame it on his behavior. And when he comes back, you can see it in his eyes. He's different. He's not walking the same way. He's not acting the same way. It's like his spirit was sucked out of him. There's been quite a few accounts of this happening over the years. However, most are just gone and never come back. That's the creepy part. Now I'm going to tell you a rumor that I heard from another guard. I cannot personally verify this myself, but I've known this guard for the last five years, and we hang out outside of work, so I trust what he says. He told me one night he was working transport duty, which is very odd to be doing at night. Almost all, and I mean all transports happen during the daylight hours. They must have been short a man because these weren't the regular guards who were part of the transport detail. He didn't recognize them. So they grabbed three prisoners who were on death row, and they had been on death row for many years. They put them in the back of a van and they go off. Their destination is about a 45 minute drive from the prison. At first, the inmates are asking what is going on and where are they going. The other guards just dismiss them and tell them to get into the van and they will soon find out. Everything is pretty quiet at first, then one of the other guards starts taunting the inmate saying, hopefully you boys got a good meal in. You're gonna need all the energy you can get. He looks over at the other guard and they start laughing. At that point, my friend is confused because he doesn't know what's going on. This is his first time ever doing this type of detail. He then asks the other guards where this transport is going to. One guard replies, the dog house, and the other guard starts laughing. At this point, he's really confused, but thought it would be best not to ask any more questions. They get to the place and they open up the back of the van. The guards grab each inmate and pulls them out of the van. My friend is now completely puzzled because he doesn't know what's going on. He tells me that when they arrived at this facility, it was at least 10 miles into the woods. They drove on dirt roads for at least 20 minutes. When they get there, this facility has a very tall barbed wire fence surrounding it. They pass through this gate with multiple guards and drive up to this loading dock where they unload the prisoners. They take them into the building and my friend said it looked like an arena where there was seating 
looking into the woods, and there were dozens of spotlights shining into the woods like a football stadium of some sort, but with only box seating. There were a group of other guards who took the inmates into custody, and then they left. On the way back, he starts grilling the other guards about what that place is and what is happening. They were reluctant to give out any information at first, but they ended up telling him that it's some type of feeding ground for creatures, like real-life monsters. They release the prisoners, and it's like a feeding frenzy for these monsters they have. One of the guards actually saw one of the events one time. What he saw is them release three men into the woods, and then a siren goes off, and then this big gate opens up. Once the gate opens, he just heard this loud beast running around, basically killing each man. He said it's hard to see anything from the ground. That's why they have the elevated seating. But he heard everything. I know it sounds crazy, but I believe him. I've known him for years, and he's a very honest person who would never make up something like this. I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, or if you have any idea what is going on in prisons at night, but I wanted to let you know about this. Take care and be safe out there. Hi Donovan, I'm a police officer in the United States. I've been on the job for about six years now, and I've seen and heard a lot of crazy things. I don't know if you're interested in police stories, but this one is pretty wild. I was working the midnight shift at a very small town jail in Tennessee. We only have three cells, two for males and one for female. The building was an old house that had been remodeled to be a jail, so it was very open with no real privacy anywhere. There were three of us working that night, me, another male officer, and a female officer. At around 4.30 a.m., we started hearing strange noises coming from upstairs, like someone was walking around. We all looked at each other like, what is that? And we just kind of shrugged it off. Then we started hearing these banging noises coming from the ceiling, like someone was hitting it with something. We again looked at each other and I said, I'm going to go check this out. I walked upstairs and found nothing. No one's there. No reason for the noises. I went back down to my co-workers and told them that I didn't see anything, but that I would be checking around outside just to see. I checked around outside and found nothing, so I went back inside. As soon as I did, the banging started again, this time louder than before. My two co-workers were looking at me like, what do we do? I went to my car and got my flashlight and my sidearm. I walked upstairs to where the banging was coming from and it was coming from behind a wall so I couldn't see what it was making the noise, but I definitely could hear it. I shined my light around and I found nothing. No one was there. I went back downstairs to my coworkers and told them the same thing. I don't know what it is. Like someone had hit something very hard. We look at each other again and just say, what is going on? Then we hear another loud bang, this time louder than before. It sounded like it came from right outside the door, which is just an open hallway leading to the cells where the noises were coming from earlier. I opened up the door and shined my light around looking for whatever made that noise. When all of the sudden something grabbed me by my shoulder and pulled me into the hallway. I fell onto the ground and my flashlight flew out of my hand and broke. My sidearm was halfway down the hallway. I immediately turned over to see what grabbed me and all I could see was this vapor dissipate into the air. I was so freaked out, I grabbed my flashlight and weapon and went back to where my coworkers were and they immediately asked me what had happened. I explained to them that some unknown force was out in the hallway and I saw it just disappear right before my eyes. It doesn't happen all the time, but every once in a while we still hear those noises. However, we don't go chasing after them anymore. I've been trying to capture some of these strange things that happen at our jail cell on camera. So far, I've had no luck, but if I do, I will surely send them in. 
I served in the military police in Iraq back in 2004. Every hour of every day was a game of Russian roulette. Improvised explosive devices would take out supply trucks that would try to escort over very dangerous roads. And there was no way of knowing where these explosives were except to just drive and hope that nobody's tires were on the wrong place at the wrong time. IEDs, they called them. Each time that I dodged death, it was the equivalent of making the right call of a coin toss. So needless to say, I was in a perpetually heightened state, running on what I would call Red Bull and pulling 18-hour shifts. When your senses are constantly in overdrive that much for that long, you don't always know if you can trust them. That's how your nerves get overdrawn and you're ripe for developing PTSD. I came back to the States with acute PTSD symptoms. But you know what? It wasn't because bullets were flying over my head, although that was a large part of the experience. See, Iraq is like one big acid trip. Ancient ruins in some shape or form are everywhere, and the locals treat them like they're no big deal. Stuff that was built closer to the time that Jesus walked the earth is irrelevant, spray painted with stuff all sorts of stuff, and a hundred dialects you'll find over there. It was one such cluster of ruins, an ancient city that lost its place in the map, where bandits and ruffians alike set up camp and decided that me and my convoy were now a target practice. I manned the gunner's nest on top of the APC that I was in. I put my life in the hands of other men that I left at the steering wheel. This batch of men weren't backing down from the cannon I used to carve out slices of the ancient ruins they were hiding behind. A few of them, I think under the influence of something, came out into the open. Well, you don't just turn down an invitation like that. I was going to blast them down. When three or four towering shapes raced out of the ruins and mauled them to death, my eyes were telling me that I was looking at walking rabid dogs. My brain was telling me that this was impossible, but it wasn't my hallucinations that were butchering those bandits before my very eyes. They didn't stop to eat. They began leaping towards my convoy like large furious dogs. And they struck me of terror that made my hand shake so much I almost couldn't aim or fire the APC's cannon. If you know anything about the stuff that goes on in Iraq, you might have heard of giants being discovered in the Iraqi mountains. Yes, I'm talking literal giants talked about in the days of Noah, in biblical stuff. That's well covered up. So I had heard stories of that from fellow soldiers here and there, but only took it with a grain of salt. I guess this area is keen, and when I say area, I mean all the Middle East, especially for its paranormal and weird stuff that goes on. So I guess I shouldn't be too surprised in hindsight, but these oversized dog creatures were just kind of shrugging the bullets off. Two of them had succumbed to their injuries. The rest of what I saw, I realized that I could actually kill them, but they scattered. I took the whole thing as a sign that I was well overdue for rest. My turn to sleep finally came, but my problems didn't end there. Strange howls and weird noises spilled into the night. My men weren't sure what to make of it since they sounded like they were coming from wolves that were immensely sized. I didn't say a thing. Deep down, I had a hunch that we were being hunted. The ones that survived were not only real, but I'm sure they wanted revenge. I didn't know how I knew this. It was just an innate feeling, like the moments when my deepest intuitions had been right. I just knew a feeling that I was a marked man. I mean, I knew that terrorists and their sympathizers were going to lash out, but they didn't have the keen senses that allowed them to zero in like these beasts do, these rabid humanoid wild dogs. Several nights passed where those otherworldly howls and growls were somewhere far away, but not too far, close enough to come calling if I ever fell asleep long enough. That awareness has wrecked me. I was discharged not long after for being deemed mentally unfit to continue my service. 
This has happened to many servicemen that never gets talked about. The howling even followed me home to Maine. How the things have tracked me across the ocean, I'll never know. Or maybe it's the sound haunting me. Maybe they aren't really flesh and blood, or only partly so. I don't know. Guns and barricades and iron bars are never far away enough anymore. It's the only way I could steal a few hours of sleep after spending hours of hearing my own heartbeat. It's probably going to give out before any of these demons come looking to make their killing blow. Thank you for listening to my story.